Hello! Today's video will be for beginners who are interested in electronics. I'll be talking about some necessary tools to start. What I have right here are what I regularly use for electronics. If you're still new to electronics, there's no need to purchase everything that I have right here. If you have a breadboard, Arduino, and a multimeter, you should be well off for a while. An expensive oscilloscope isn't necessary at all. If you're interested after a while and want to keep going with electronics, you should then purchase these extra tools. Once again, this video is for those who are interested in electronics but don't know what tools to prepare. I won't cover any of the special tools and measuring machines I use regularly, so I'll make another video for any other tools I believe I should touch on. There's one more thing I need to tell y'all before starting. Electronics is a very hard hobby and field of study to engage in without any prior knowledge. This is the sad truth. For example, you'd at least need to know how to calculate the current in a parallel circuit. Other calculations include calculating the appropriate resistance to pass through a diode. If you're able to do this, you should be well off. You should be able to manage these calculations if you've taken a high school level circuit course. And even if you don't have any prior knowledge, these calculations should be manageable, so trying out electronics is also a valid option. The first tool you'll need is a breadboard. A breadboard is a tool that allows you to easily create circuits. An interesting characteristic of the breadboard is the rows are connected with each other. On this breadboard, there are five holes in each column, which are all internally connected. Up to five components can be inserted. These red holes are all connected with each other vertically. The same can be said for the blue holes. This circuit connects the LED with the power source. The LED anode connects with the plus side, and the cathode connects with this other hole. Connect one leg of the resistor with the LED cathode, and the other with the minus side, and the LED will turn on. I was actually making this circuit using the breadboard. I inserted a resistance so the LED wouldn't break from the current. To create blueprints like this, some prior knowledge on circuits is necessary. The next component is related to the breadboard. It's the jump wire. The jump wire is used when making multiple circuits on a breadboard. Let me connect the LED and resistance using one. Like this, the jump wire lets you connect parts even if they're far away from the circuit. Using a jump wire allows for more flexible planning as you can use the entire breadboard more freely. There are two types of jump wires. The first has multiple lines while the second has a single line. I used to think that the multiple line jump wire was flexible and easier to use, but I don't really recommend it right now because the wires inside are more susceptible to breaking. It often breaks right here. I've accidentally used a torn wire and wasted hours on unnecessary debugging. I rarely use the multiple line jump wire and instead use the single line jump wire as of lately. The second thing necessary is the multimeter. It can measure voltage, current, and capacitance. The multimeter has two wires coming out of it like this. By attaching the wires where you want to measure, you can measure the current, voltage, and resistance. Let's try measuring the resistance. This is the resistance. If you put the wires against the resistance, the multimeter shows a resistance of 0 0.98 ohms. This is basically a 1 kilo ohm resistance. This is how we measure the resistance. We can also measure the current on both sides of a diode, the current on both sides of a resistance, and 
the current of a battery. A multimeter is very useful in many scenarios. Let's say we've made a proper circuit on a breadboard, but for some reason, the current wasn't passing and the circuit wasn't functioning. Measuring the circuit using a multimeter could uncover the reason behind the malfunction. The next tool we'll need is the battery. A 5 volt AC adapter should be good enough. 5 volts is enough because most electronic components, such as ICs, are made to function at 5 volts. The Arduino I'll be introducing also functions and works at 5 volts. Thus, a 5 volt AV adapter should be enough. You should be aware of one thing when purchasing an AC adapter. In this condition, the AC adapter cannot be connected to the breadboard. A converter plug is necessary for the adapter to be compatible. The next tool I'll be introducing is the Arduino. I contemplated whether or not I should include this, but ended up including the Arduino because it broadened the variety of electronics possible. There's a lot of information about the Arduino on the internet, as well as a lot of books about it as well. I felt the Arduino would be useful for introductory beginners. The Arduino is easy to manage for novices and also has a surplus of information, so I felt it was the best option for beginners. What I really like about it is you can start electronics with just a couple of components and a single computer. For example, an Arduino allows alternating flashing LED lights and a functioning turbo motor. There are different types of Arduinos as well. This is Arduino Nano and this is Arduino Omega. The Arduino Uno is the most famous. The Arduino Uno and Nano function in the same way but they are both different in sizes. The Arduino Nano is smaller in size. The Arduino Uno and Nano are both recommendable. But I've only ever used the Arduino Nano. I've never used the Arduino Uno. The reason why I like the Arduino Nano is because of how compact it is and its compatibility with this breadboard. It's easy to prototype as you can just insert it onto the breadboard. These are the reasons why I use the Arduino Nano. Another thing you'll have to consider when choosing is whether or not you'll get the legit or the substitute Arduino. The legitimate version costs a decent amount. The official version costs around 2,000 yen. On the other hand, substitute versions can be bought for around 500 yen. I recommend buying the official version. Once you have the computer and Arduino, all you need are the individual parts, but there are honestly too many types, you'll probably be lost as to what to buy. For novices, there's actually a starter kit that I'd like to recommend. The starter kit has the most components necessary for introductory electronics. It contains a breadboard, jump wires, resistance, LEDs, and other necessary components. I recommend purchasing a starter kit if you're interested in starting electronics. The next thing I'll recommend preparing will depend on the person. I'm sure many of y'all aren't really sure on how to program and use an Arduino. There's a lot of information online on how to use the Arduino and how to make it function. Some easier examples are making the LED flash or moving the turbo motor. However, most of the information on the internet is scattered all over the web, so there isn't really a source online with information all in one place. If you don't want to search yourself, I recommend buying a textbook. Textbooks have all the information in one place and also are easier to follow, especially for novices. If you're the type who's too lazy to search for information all over the internet, try purchasing a textbook and programming an Arduino. The tools that I've introduced today are the bare minimum for electronic novices. Depending on the person and what you want to do, but try asking the comments if you need some extra help preparing.
I'm planning to go a bit in depth for those who are more interested in pursuing electronics seriously. The first thing I want to introduce is the toolbox for electronic components. If you plan on continuing electronics for a long time, you might need some spare space for your components. You might want to sort out similar tools and put them in a toolbox altogether. This box contains tools related to microcomputers. I purchased these cases at Monotaro, and this one has all the capacitors. It's really easy to find stuff if you sort them by genre and category. They're especially useful for smaller pieces. This case stores all of the resistances. Writing down all of the ranges of the resistances helps when finding the necessary parts. This is how I store my smaller individual parts. There are also types that work as racks, which I recommend using as well. The next tool I recommend owning is a soldering iron. A soldering iron is used to thaw and mold solder. It can be used on printed circuit boards to fasten and solidify specific parts. It's also nice to have some flux, a tool which makes soldering easier. You want to plaster the flux on the portion which you want to solder. And solder the same way you always do. There's also a desoldering machine which vacuums away any excessive solder if you've accidentally soldered too much. You want to push this in and push the button. This vacuums away any excessive solder using air. You should also prepare a universal board, tin wires, and some electrical cables. This is the universal board, and this is how the back of the board looks a lot of copper foil on the back. On the board and the foil, there are a lot of small holes. You want to insert the components through the hole and solder using a soldering iron. The universal board is convenient when making small, short-range circuits. This is an automatic spray bottle I made before. I used a universal board to make the circuit here. If you look at the back of the board, you can see how I used the tin wires and the electrical cables. Using a universal board, tin wires, and electrical cables, I'm able to lay out and plan freely. So these parts are convenient when making small, short-range circuits. When we're dealing with larger circuits, we usually use print boards instead. Now, I'm going to explain the tools for those with some extra cash in their pockets that are totally absorbed in electronics. The first is a scientific calculator. Most calculations can be done using a normal calculator or Microsoft Excel, but having a scientific calculator on hand is always so convenient. This can be said about most calculators, but they help when making minor calculations that are necessary. If you tried to make the same calculation on a computer, You'd have to type while using your keyboard or move your mouse and move back and forth from your computer. Using a scientific calculator, you can do the same calculation so much easier. What's nice about a scientific calculator is that it contains most complex scientific functions. It contains trigonomic functions, ratios, roots, and it can also deal with natural numbers. A scientific calculator is definitely nice to have when dealing with these functions. I'd say these scientific calculators can be purchased on Amazon for about 2,000 yen. Next, I want to introduce this power source, which you can freely control and choose the voltage. When dealing with electronics, there are chimes you want to choose the voltage, like 5 volts, 9 volts, 15 volts, or 24 volts. If you have this power supply, you can easily choose the output voltage. I bought this power supply new and it cost me about 50,000 yen. 
If you check some auction websites, you can find some as cheap as 10,000 yen. So you might want to consider buying a used one. However, there is no guarantee that a used one works. So if you want a power supply that works, I'd recommend purchasing it new. Next is the oscilloscope, which checks the waveforms of the voltage. On the screen is a 14 kilohertz waveform. We obviously cannot see a 14 kilohertz wavelength. So this is where the oscilloscope comes into play. Let me give you an example of when this is useful. We have a blue LED light turned on right here. Do you know what kind of voltage is being fed into the LED? I don't know as well. We'll never be able to identify the waveform of the voltage being fed into the LED unless we use an oscilloscope. Looking at the screen of the oscilloscope, we can see there is a 10 kHz voltage being fed in to turn on the LED. Using an oscilloscope helps identify waveforms in scenarios such as this. I purchased this oscilloscope new for 50,000 yen. It has four channels and can detect 50 MHz. If you want to try making an FM radio, you'd want to get an oscilloscope that can detect up to 200 MHz. There are many oscilloscopes on auction online, but once again, there is no guarantee that they'd work. Once again, if you want to be sure, I'd recommend buying one new. A famous oscilloscope manufacturer is Tektronix. If you tried to purchase one of their oscilloscopes, they'd cost around 200 to 300 million yen. If you think about it that way, I'd recommend a cheap oscilloscope like this one. The last tool I'd recommend is a function generator. A function generator produces waveforms. There are certain situations when you want to create a certain waveform. I use the function generator in these situations, from sine waves to cosine waves. Many different types of waves can be created. Triangle, sawtooth, and reverse sawtooth waves can also be created using this generator. The frequency can also be adjusted as well as the amplitude as well. The function generator is very convenient for making various waveforms. The function generator isn't a requirement, but it definitely helps broaden the spectrum of projects you're able to do in electronics. As of now, that's all. Today, I introduced the required and recommended tools for those who are planning to get into electronics. If you noticed anything else that you think is a necessity for electronics, please leave your suggestion in the comment section below and share it with the other viewers. If you felt like this video was of any use to you, please leave a comment, like, and subscribe. Thank you for watching the video to the very end.